He's one of the biggest names in entertainment, and it all started with a comedic take on a classic toy. This is how Jimmy Fallon went from easy breezy boyhood to late night staple. While some comedians generate laughs to hide a deep well of anger and pain, that's not the case with James Thomas Fallon. As he told NPR's Fresh Air in 2017, I know it's odd for a comedian, I think I really did have a happy childhood. I was always a happy kid. Fallon was close to his family, including his grandparents, who lived in a small cottage in the backyard and taught him how to drive. If anything, his childhood was perhaps a bit too protective. As his sister Gloria told Vanity Fair in 2014, we weren't even allowed to cross the street on our own until we were 10 or 12. Young Jimmy Fallon gravitated to comedy early on, including the Dr. Demento radio show and the British sketch series Monty Python's Flying Circus. Then, in his teenage years, he discovered Saturday Night Live. Watching the show as it aired live on Saturday nights was something that Fallon approached with a near-religious level of devotion. In fact, he insisted on watching all by himself to absorb every nuance without any distractions. As he explained to Vanity Fair, I just didn't want anyone ruining my experience. No small talk. I wanted to see the sketches, the new characters, what the angle was. Fallon wasn't just a fan, as he was watching with a singular goal in mind, to one day be an SNL cast member himself. As he told the Associated Press in 2002, I always said I want to be on SNL before I'm 27. It was almost to the point of craziness. I just thought, I gotta get on. You yeah. were born the year the Saturday Night Live went on the air. In the studio. <laughs> I'm trying to make it more I remember that show. Fallon took a big step toward his comedy dreams when his mother Gloria told him about an impression contest at Bananas Comedy Club in Poughkeepsie, New York. It required three minutes of material, so Fallon came up with the idea of using a troll doll as a framing device to showcase his impressions of Jerry Seinfeld, John Travolta, and other celebs. Just 17 years old at the time, Fallon ended up winning the first place cash prize of $700. As Fallon continued to pursue live comedy, he quickly discovered that $700 for a three-minute performance was the exception and not the rule, as actual comedy gigs generally paid significantly less. Nevertheless, he was hooked. He began competing in talent shows and became the weekend MC at the same comedy show where he debuted his troll doll act. During his senior year at the College of St. Rose in Albany, New York, Fallon sent out a tape of his stand-up comedy and some headshots, which led to an invite to Los Angeles. Just 15 credits shy of graduating, he told his parents that he wanted to drop out of school and head to Hollywood to launch his comedy career. They supported his decision and pulled together as much money as possible to send him on his way. Fallon slept on a friend's couch for a few months before he eventually got his own place. He took improv classes and landed his first professional acting role, a bit part, on the sitcom Spin City. He also also performed stand-up at the famous comedy club, The Improv, where he was paid a measly $7.50 per set. Soon enough, all of his hard work would pay off enough for him to achieve one of his most cherished goals. Based on the strength of the tape that he sent out to producers, Fallon landed an audition for Saturday Night Live. But it didn't go so well, with Tracy Morgan hired instead of him at the time. He was understandably devastated, but not for long, as SNL called him up once again the following year for another tryout. This time, they advised him to ditch his troll doll act and come up with something new. Before Fallon's audition, he was told repeatedly not to be discouraged if SNL creator and showrunner Lorne Michaels didn't laugh, as he had a reputation for never laughing during auditions. But as Fallon recalled, I made Lorne laugh. He put his head in his hands and he laughed, and I thought, wow. Even if I don't get this, I can tell my friends, like, I made Lorne Michaels laugh. Also in the room for that audition was Tina Fey, who recalled to Vanity Fair in 2014, he's one of two people I've ever seen who was completely ready to be on the show. Kristen Wiig is the other one, and Jimmy was ready, like, if there had been a show to do that night. Jimmy Fallon officially joined the cast of Saturday Night Live as a featured player in the fall of 1998 for the show's 24th season. It didn't take long for him to make an impression on viewers thanks to his comedic musical performances and a pitch-perfect impression of former cast member Adam Sandler. Once again, something that could have been brought to my attention yesterday! As Lorne Michaels noted to New York Magazine in 1999, the people who pop first on this show are the ones who you believe you can see right into their hearts. It was true of Gilda Radner, it was true of John Belushi, and it's true of Jimmy. You just feel you know them. In 2000, during Fallon's third season, he received the ultimate SNL seal of approval when he and Tina Fey were tapped to co-host Weekend Update the series' iconic spoof of the news. As one of the most popular cast members of the late 90s and early 2000s, Fallon's stint on the iconic sketch series fulfilled his childhood dreams and made him a superstar in his own right.
Jimmy Fallon left SNL in 2004 at the end of the show's 29th season and then attempted to make the jump to movie stardom. He'd already had a few supporting parts here and there, but now he was trying to be a leading man. The first attempt was 2004's Taxi, in which he played a rookie cop who teams up with a feisty cab driver played by Queen Latifah. He followed that up with the 2005 rom-com Fever Pitch as a Boston Red Sox superfan opposite Drew Barrymore. Neither film did particularly well at the box office, though. As far as Fallon could see, the door to Hollywood that opened from his SNL success closed just as quickly. His failure to register on the big screen left him unmoored during what was a particularly bleak time in his career. As he admitted to Vanity Fair, I was probably drinking more than I should have been drinking. It wasn't like sitting and watching old tapes of me on SNL with the screen flickering in front of me, but I was like, I can't figure out what I want to do. While Fever Pitch didn't exactly light up the box office, it continues to hold a special place in its leading man's heart. That's because, during the production, Fallon got to know Nancy Juvonen, co-owner of the Flower Films production company alongside Drew Barrymore. Fallon had already met Juvonen a few years earlier when Barrymore hosted SNL, but it was on the Fever Pitch set that the two really connected. You just stuck out and I was like, and you're just so fun. We had so much fun on that. Yeah, we had so we? much fun. Then, in August 2007, Fallon and Javonen got engaged. That December, they had the opportunity to spend a few days on a tropical island owned by billionaire Sir Richard Branson. They decided to ditch plans for a large ceremony down the road and instead have an impromptu wedding. In 2013, they welcomed their first child together, a daughter named Winnie Rose. A second daughter, Frances Cole, arrived the following year. Both girls were born via surrogacy. Jimmy Fallon's movie career may have floundered, but his time in showbiz was far from over. In 2008, NBC announced that he would become the new host of Late Night, taking over for outgoing host Conan O'Brien, who was set to begin hosting The Tonight Show. And it just so happened that this new gig was being produced by his old SNL boss, Lorne Michaels, who felt that Fallon's non-competitive style of comedy made him a natural for the job. As Michaels told Vanity Fair, he never felt diminished by other people being funny. The opposite, he enjoyed when other people were funny. NBC executives weren't so sure, though, but Michaels stuck to his guns. As Fallon recalled to USA Today, he said, "'If you don't do it with Jimmy, I won't produce.'" Fallon was initially just as hesitant as the network was, until his wife encouraged him to at least give it a try. As he revealed to Vanity Fair, Nancy was like, "'You've got to try it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work.'" In 2013, Jimmy Fallon received a big promotion when he was tapped to host The Tonight Show, arguably the most prestigious gig on late-night television. This time, there was no hesitancy from the network, as Fallon was now a proven commodity. Even Paul McCartney believed that he would bring a fresh energy to the show. As the former Beatle told Vanity Fair, "...he's a major fan of people, and that's very endearing when you're working with him. It comes across to the audience, too. Here's this guy who has the same enthusiasms as you, but he happens to have his own talk show." For decades, The Tonight Show had been broadcast cast from Burbank, California, but with Fallon taking over, it would now be returning to New York City for the first time in over 40 years. When Fallon made his debut as host in February 2014, his first episode drew a whopping 11.3 million viewers, making it the show's second most-watched episode in half a decade. My goal is just uh, make you laugh and put a smile on your face so that you, you, you go to sleep with a smile on your face and live a longer life. During the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, Jimmy Fallon was among the many people who suddenly found themselves working from home. While Tonight Show reruns aired on NBC, Fallon quickly pivoted, producing his own at-home shows that were posted on YouTube. Interviewing celebrity guests via Zoom while his wife Nancy served as camera operator, Fallon's low-tech take on a late-night talk show charmed viewers during a very fraught period. Eventually, NBC axed the reruns and began airing the at-home shows in the regular Tonight Show time slot. For Fallon, doing nothing while quarantining simply wasn't an option. As he explained to Entertainment Weekly, I said, I have to do something. I just can't go off the air and disappear. People need something just to balance with all this craziness that's happening right now. I just wanted to make sure everyone, all my staff writers, are safe and at home. And then everyone was on board. All of my writing staff and my producers were like, let's put on a show. Fallon eventually returned to his studio a few months later with health and safety precautions in place. But those at-home shows proved to be a revelatory experience. As he had to People magazine, it was like taking a course in communications or filmmaking. It was definitely challenging, definitely scary, but we did so much this past year. 
Jimmy Fallon found himself at the center of scandal in September 2023. That was when Rolling Stone reported on allegations from former and current Tonight Show employees who claimed that Fallon had fostered a toxic workplace. He was specifically accused of unpredictable mood swings that had staff walking on eggshells around him. As one former employee explained, you never knew which Jimmy we were going to get and when he was going to throw a hissy fit. And another former staffer added, it was like if Jimmy is in a bad mood, everyone's day is f***. Fallon addressed the allegations during a Zoom meeting as he reportedly told his staff, "'It's embarrassing, and I feel so bad.'" Meanwhile, other employees contacted Entertainment Tonight to respond to the allegations made to Rolling Stone. An assistant on the show claimed that that report had misrepresented what it was like to work there, while adding, "'I've had an incredible time working at the show. Jimmy has a great heart and a genuine goal of bringing joy to everyone.'"